Okay, good morning, and thank you for the introduction, Ralph, and for the, the kind of, <laughs> you violated one of the key rules of over-promising. I don't want to under-deliver now because you said we would be better than you. Um, so I'm not going to promise that, but what I do want to do today is, is, is tell a story of the work that we're doing around community health and also engaging small to mid-sized enterprises in that conversation of how to really move the needle collectively towards better health outcomes both as for individuals, but as and really focusing on the organizational institutional levers and intervention um, opportunities that are available both to us as a collective uh, convener, but also the organizations on the ground. So just by way of background, um, we're going to focus, I'm going to focus today on small to mid-sized employers. Um, and our work really has come out of two um, the convergence of two of our programming efforts, and that's one around this community health transformation model, which we've been piloting now in six communities, and then our work around improving the health of employees and taking a population level approach um, with that work. And you know, over the past couple of years, those started as very distinct programming without overlap, and they've converged really in this kind of nice nucleus around small to mid-sized enterprises. It's a space that we feel both requires and needs a lot of attention and energy, and one that we think that this collective impact model and the resources that we can bring to bear both with our partners on the ground and those at the national level um, can effectuate some real change and impact. So I'm excited to share the story with you, but I do want to give away the ending of this presentation, which is there is no ending to this story. Right now, we don't know what the finish line is. We're about a year and a half into formal work with engaging SMEs in our communities, and to be quite honest, it's an iterative process. It's one in which we've borrowed from a lot of different models relied on our collective impact model um, at the community and regional level and one in which you know quite frankly I'm excited to have conversations with folks in the room and out and uh, uh, otherwise you know folks that are watching um, on the live stream to really inform how that work moves forward in the future and how we engage SMEs in a more purposeful and, and impactful way just some quick background on the foundation. Clinton Foundation operates 11 different initiatives, the Clinton Health Matters Initiative being one of those. And our focus really is the prevention and treatment of chronic diseases across the entire age spectrum. So how do we do that? One, we do that through partnerships of purpose. We specifically know that we may not be the content experts in a lot of these issues, and quite frankly, I'm not a content expert in obesity, but we're process and program experts, and we know how to design processes and programs that move forward and harness the collective impact of many different organizations so that one plus one plus one doesn't equal three. Hopefully, in our case, it equals 10, it equals 15. We can impact, or we can increase the impact, reach, and scope of the work that we do through these partnerships of purpose. Two, as Nico mentioned, we really do rely on the University of Wisconsin's um, social determinants of health model, um, knowing that quality of care and access to care are important, but they're not as important as the vast other, you know, spectrum of other indicators. So much of our work does focus on employment, education, the built environment, sexual health, physical health, all the other determinants that we know really are impactful and that we know that we can harness a lot of interesting and new partners in this space of, of health improvement, ones that aren't traditionally in the clinical, medical, or public health setting. And then lastly, one of our key principles is really looking at communities of needs. So really looking at those populations communities and groups that suffer disproportionately from inequitable health outcomes. And so that is always kind of our top line filter of whether or not we move into a space. Is there demonstrated need? Are there communities in which there disconnects to resources, access, or programming that could really be impactful in a way that isn't in some other communities? So that's one of the, that's the primary lens that we look through um, for most of our work. So now I want to tell you the story of two of our programming um, areas and how they came together around um, the, the focus and converged around SMEs. Our first is our community health transformation program. And this is a program now that really does rely on the collective impact model to convene stakeholders across six regions nationwide. And we're on pace to add about two more communities this year alone. With this model, or in this model, we serve as neutral conveners, facilitators, and resource brokers for stakeholders across that broad spectrum of health um, uh, of, of organizations and, and affected individuals. So it's not just your hospital systems, your insurers, and your government agencies, but it is your employers, both big and small. It's your folks in the education space, 
people in the parks and recs um, youth serving <laughs> organization. It is the broadest spectrum possible and one that we, we serve as the backbone organization and any collective impact model, the backbone organization really is key to making sure that these, these efforts and these programs are sustainable and embedded in the community and that's what we bring to the table. We have a five to seven year commitment in each of these communities um, and we're now in the process in California, for example, we're already in year four in Illinois, which is our newest community, that's Knox County, Illinois, we're in year one. So different phases, diverse geographies, both urban and rural, um, both big and small, just in terms of size of population, five million or upwards of five million in Houston, Harris County, as small as 35,000 in Adams County, Mississippi. And so our, it was purposeful to kind of spread ourselves out around those different communities so that we could test this model and the community and the collective impact approach in a variety of settings and also feed that data back into future efforts with new communities. And so we're excited with the work that we're doing here. And, and really what we've done so far is we've set the path, we've, we've identified the data and presented that to the communities in each of these four, six um, regions. We've gone through a process of needs prioritization and identification. And then also more, I think, importantly, the development of strategic plans, what we call blueprints for action, in five of the six communities now, which we are now spending the majority of our time helping communities on the ground implement against that strategic plan. So that's one way that we're aligning or, or in attempting to get all the organizations on the ground to align their efforts and their resources towards a common goal of collectively addressing health, um, really at the 15,000 foot level and the 30,000 foot level. Uh, the other area which we have defined programming and which is kind of important in this conversation, or very important in this conversation, is the topic of employee health and supporting better health in workplaces through interventions across a continuum of that, that social determinants model. So looking just not just at EAPs and traditional methods of intervention in the work site, but really looking at the full spectrum of opportunities to engage employers and employees in the conversation. I won't spend a lot of time on the why, because I'm going to guess that you are all much more well-versed in the why and already know why the why. Um, and Ralph laid some of that out and Nico laid some, some of that out as well in the, in the presentation. Presentations. But in terms of cost, in terms of energy and resources in retention, recruitment, sustained efforts in, in, in having a productive and effective workforce, we know that all of these things are impacted by an individual's health. And that for folks who are spending 8 to 12 hours a day in a work site, their, their well-being and their health contributes greatly to the organizational effectiveness and the culture and the ability of the employer to really impact and be productive. And so this was one area where A, we saw a defined need, and then two, to be quite frank, which is how the Clinton Foundation also operates in some cases, our principals saw this as a very um, urgent place for the foundation to, to focus its attention and its efforts. So it was a nice convergence of both um, what we saw where there was a demonstrated need and where we heard from our principals they wanted us to move towards. <coughs> And so then drilling down even further, we've done some research and we've collected and compiled some of the research around the need for SMEs in, in, in the health conversation and really looking at both, there is a desire for SMEs to engage in this. Over two thirds in a, in a survey that was done in 2012 of SME either um, owners or health um, professionals responded that they were interested in, in worksite wellness programs, but only one in five actually had worksite wellness programs of any kind um, instituted in their workforce. Um, the other interesting thing coming out of these surveys is one, that nano businesses, those two to nine are self-identified as two to 15 employees, saw themselves as more equipped to provide worksite wellness than those in the kind of mid-size range, and that um, across the board, the top priorities for small to mid-sized enterprises were mental health and stress, obesity, and um, chronic disease management and prevention. And so some of our own surveys too with the, the employers that we've convened through our community health transformation maps and mirrors that, but also has helped us identify additional constraints. And those are traditional constraints that I think you may have already heard. It's cost, quite frankly, it's resources, the inability to provide effective or enough resources for their employees, at least they, they feel that they don't have the capacity to do that. And then also there's a lack of, of knowledge or a lack of, of really knowing where to go to access these resources. In a lot of these cases, it's not that they're not out there, but there is a lot of clutter and noise in this space. And for a small size employer or a business owner, it's hard to know who to turn to and where to go for these types of resources. 
And so what we've developed is, is a two-pronged approach. One is we've put forth a framework, which is a compendium of best practices that have been compiled by a host of, or put forth by a host of agencies and, and uh, reputable sources in this space, folks like the CDC. Um, we borrowed from Hero as well and compiled that into a one-stop shop for employers of all sizes. Um, but I think what's more important um, than the fra or more important than than some of the best practices is really the approach that we've laid out, which again is nothing that is proprietary to the Clinton Health Matters Initiative. It really is based on effective models of intervention with the theories of change or theory of change. So it's one, building support, two, assessing your capacity, three, developing your policy, four, connecting to resources, both internal and external, and five, uh, implementing that policy and allowing that implementation to be incremental if it needs to be. So knowing that there is a, a spectrum of interventions and there are a menu of options and there's no prescriptive right answer for any of this that you know really is context sensitive and dependent on the data that you receive from your employers and from your employee population, but then also to where you have the capacity to move and where you may not have the capacity. And then it is a continual cyclical process, um, I mean process. Evaluate, revise at the sixth step, but you start back at one or you start and jump back in at two, wherever it is you need to refine um, is really where we want you to be. And that's the process that we've embedded in our framework and our work with employers of all sizes. Now where this translates to Sorry, I'm just going to advance one of these slides. Or if someone could advance the slide for me. Did it go? There we go. Sorry about that. So where this is, has netted us is really around this shared interest of both the work that we're doing at the community level and the work that we're doing with SMEs. And these, the work that we're doing at the community level really is driven by the SMEs in each of our six regions. What we've been able to do is really identify what are those shared goals and values both at the regional and institutional level that map back to the employers in each of those six communities. And we've done this because the SME employers and business owners were involved in that process from the very beginning. We originally convened them as part of a larger um, coalition of invested stakeholders and from that we've now also focused our efforts on them and done the same process with them of, of mapping out where the data points them to in terms of their needs, how to prioritize those needs collectively and how we can begin to bridge those needs with programs or resources um, to really move the needle on the health of their employee populations and again map back to the work that we're doing at the larger level. Um, so our engagement strategy is, is, is centered around that local context. It's ide identifying the local partners which are different in each of the six communities. In Arkansas we're working with the Arkansas Hospitality Association which covers 3,000 members from the hospitality sector and convening their membership base to have this conversation of how, why do we do this, how do we do it, how do we do it together, and what does the impact and, eval and, and uh, evaluation of this effort look like in three years and four years. And so where we are right now in each of the communities is a little different, but this is the overall process of how we engage um, SMEs in each of those communities, identifying the local partners, convening the, SMEs co the SME cohorts in each of these communities multiple times, um, prioritizing needs collectively, connecting them to resources, both, again, locally and nationally, things that we know are partners that we have in the space that work nationally, and then monitoring and assessing collective process. I want to dive a little deep just really quickly on one of the tools that we're providing um, the SMEs, and it's done in partnership with Aon Hewitt. They are developing an SME toolkit for us that focuses on no to low cost intervention methods. One of the, again, addressing one of the key barriers to a lot of this work is if I'm a business owner and I have 10 employees and I'm struggling to operate on a day to day basis, um, how do I implement policies or programs that don't affect my bottom line or don't further cut into my costs? And so what we've done with Aon Hewitt is begin to put together a, a kit that walks SMEs through the process of revising policies, providing best practices and recommended approaches in three key, four key areas actually, which I'll go into just really quickly afterwards. And then Again, b connecting them to local resources and connecting them to a cohort of like-minded business owners and employers that where they can share uh, resources, share obstacles and barriers, and where the Clinton Foundation as that backbone organization can convene and provide the platform for them to do so. And so this is just a quick overview of the four key components that are included in this toolkit. One is around building support and engaging leadership, both top-down, bottom-up, 
Two is around physical activity. Uh, three is nutrition. And then four is mental health. Um, and some of these have yet to be fully flushed out because we're only on the second draft of our toolkit. That's another full disclosure. Um, but as we provide or as we finalize that toolkit, these, each of these different components will have, in essence, tearaway cut sheets that employers can use to guide their resources or to guide their efforts around this, this issue uh, moving forward. And then lastly, the important part of, around evaluation and impact, this is something that we are now working with each of the cohorts to identify what the appropriate metrics and indicators are for each of their regions. And all of this is also being wrapped up in a higher level evaluation of our community health transformation model that is ongoing and that has started and will we'll have the first report out um, on the progress of that work in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, so I'm out of time, just out of time. I think I made it uh, down to 10 seconds. Um, but I appreciate your time here, and I thank the Academy for allowing me to share what we're doing with SMEs and look forward to feedback and comments and questions on any of this. So thank you very much. Thank you.